Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone here? Welcome to the Center for Politics and Governance's panel discussion on voting system integrity. Can we be confident of the accuracy of the results? In other words, are we ready for the November election? I want to uh, just share a little bit about the center with you. The center launched a year ago as part of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and our mission is to look at politics and governance in a nonpartisan way and help teach the next generation of leaders not simply how to master the system we have, but how to improve it to make it function more effectively to serve our citizenry and how to produce better policy. So that is why today we are so, so pleased to have our very distinguished panel here to discuss the pressing issues of voting system integrity, how we handle voting in this historic election. Uh, Ray Martinez will moderate today's panel. Ray is a, an adjunct professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and a fellow of the Center for Politics and Governance. He teaches an election law course for the LBJ School and uh, previously served on the Elections Assistance Commission. So we are very, very honored that Ray would moderate today's panel and I will leave it to him to introduce our very distinguished guest, many of whom you will have seen their names and their faces in the press as, uh, as people start to do many, many stories and cover these issues. These are the experts who they turn to for commentary on these issues. So with that, let me turn it over to Ray Martinez. Thank you, Ronnie. I appreciate that, appreciate the introduction, and I greatly appreciate your leadership as the director of the Center for Politics and Governance. Uh, I know Paul Steckler is here as well, who um, uh, helped to recruit me to come to the LBJ School to teach as an adjunct. Uh, I'm so appreciative, Ronnie, of your leadership, of Paul's leadership. Uh, I think the center of the CPG at the LBJ School is doing terrific things um, with courses and also with bringing uh, really experts in the field of uh, politics uh, to venues like this where we can actually uh, have good candid discussions and uh, interact with our audience and um, and inform the public which is what it's all about so thank you for your leadership we are here today for an important discussion uh, on uh, election law and as Ronnie mentioned I teach uh, election law and policy at the uh, LBJ School of Public Affairs um, and uh, it's my second year to be teaching there as an adjunct uh, and the, the, the focus of my course at the LBJ School is not election law uh, bro uh, broadly defined. Uh, the election law comprises, of course, issues like campaign finance, like redistricting. But ever since uh, 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 the presidential election of 2000, uh, where we had a uh, uh, presidency decided by uh, less than 1,000 votes, uh, uh, the election administration has become a, a very important branch of election law. So when we talk about election law, it's not just issues about campaign finance, it's not just issues pertaining to uh, redistricting, but increasingly and perhaps even more so uh, over the past seven or eight years, we've been talking about issues pertaining to the mechanics of how we vote, uh, the mechanics of uh, how we uh, recruit and train poll workers, for example, um, the uh, procedures and, uh, pro and policies uh, for how we acquire uh, voting systems and how we test those voting systems to make sure that they are uh, accurate uh, and uh, and uh, uh, can capture accurately capture uh, voters' choices uh, each election cycle. So uh, election administration has become an extremely important part uh, of the overall discussion when it comes to election law issues, and certainly uh, the mechanics of how we vote. Um, should be on the minds of every uh, citizen, of every voter in this country, uh, because of the importance and relevance to these, uh, uh, to, to our great democracy. So we're here today, we've assembled an excellent panel. As Roddy said, our topic for today is uh, voting system integrity. Uh, we will try to focus a lot of our questions and comments on uh, the process for how we ensure uh, that voting systems have integrity and of course are accurate uh, each election cycle, but we also want to cover issues that are broader uh, than just uh, voting systems as well. We have assembled a panel of experts that bring uh, experience, uh, that bring knowledge beyond just uh, voting systems. Uh, they can talk about any aspect of the voting process, so we want to open up to those types of uh, questions and that type of discussion as well. So with that, let me go through a brief introduction of each of our panelists. Uh, I'll go in the order that they are seated uh, to my left. 
uh, and just do a brief introduction and we can uh, welcome them after the introductions. Uh, to my immediate left is Rosemary Rodriguez, who is currently a commissioner and the current chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Uh, Commissioner Rodriguez was nominated by President Bush last year, confirmed by the U.S. Senate on February 15, 2007. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez was elected chair of the EAC for this year, 2008, after serving as vice chair last year. Her term extends through December 12, 2007. Uh, and beyond that, obviously, she is currently uh, nominated for an additional term on the EAC. Uh, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Rodriguez comes to the EAC after three years on the Denver, Colorado City Council, where she served as its president from 2005 to 2006. She was director of boards and commissions for the mayor's office, from 2002 to 2003. She's been active in numerous grassroots civic and voter advocacy organizations, including the voter, uh, Colorado Voter Initiative, where she co-chaired a statewide initiative to allow Election Day voter registration. She is also co-founder of the Latina Initiative, a voter registration project to register Latino voters and provide nonpartisan election information to the Latino community. To her left, Doug Chapin. Doug Chapin is the founding director of electionline.org. For those of you who are interested in election uh, uh, administration issues, electionline.org is the source of information, updated every day, uh, has uh, newspaper articles and, and other information from around the country, and it is a terrific source, the best source, as far as I'm concerned, uh, for election law and election administration news. Uh, and the electionline.org is a part of the Pew uh, charitable trusts, uh, and specifically the Pew Center on States. Uh, Mr. Chapin uh, is nationally recognized in election administration policy since 2001. Uh, his most, he was most recently in private legal practice in Washington, D.C. after three years as elections counsel to the minority of the U.S. Senate Committee on Rules and Administration. Uh, Doug holds a law degree from Georgetown University and a master's in public administration from Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, I think is undergraduate from Princeton, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Doug, thank you for being here and welcome. To Doug's left uh, is Professor Dan Wallach. Uh, Dr. Wallach is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at Rice University in Houston and is associate director of the National Science Foundation's ACCURATE, which is an acronym that stands for a Center for Correct, Usable, Reliable, Auditable, and transparent elections. He received his PhD from Princeton University and did his undergraduate work at UC Berkeley. His research at Rice involve, involves computer security and the issues of building secure and robust software systems for the internet. He has testified about voting system security issues before government bodies in the US, Mexico, and the European Union. And I know recently testified before the Texas legislature as well, before the elections committee. Uh, and served as an expert witness in a number of voting technology lawsuits and recently participated in California's top to bottom audit of its voting systems. To uh, Dr. Wallach's left is Mr. David Byrne. David serves as executive director of the Election Technology Council, a nonprofit trade association comprised of election technology providers. He has held this position since May of last year. Since its formation in 2003, the Election Technology Council has worked to provide a unified vo voice for its election industry member companies to educate federal and state governments, legislators, the media, and other election community constituents on issues related to election technology. Uh, Mr. Byrne has close, has close to a decade of practical experience in the conduct of U.S. elections combined with public affairs. Uh, but prior to joining the Election Technology Council, he served as Director of Public Affairs, a position he held for five years for Harris County Clerk Beverly Kaufman. Prior to his tenure in Harris County, Mr. Byrne served as Election Administrator for Fort Bend County, Texas, and as Assistant to the Supervisor of Elections in Broward County, Florida, which is, in Fort, which is Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Mr. Byrne has a Bachelor's Degree in Political Science from Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina, and a Master's Degree in public administration from Florida Atlantic University. To Mr. Burns' left is Ann McGeehan. Ann uh, serves as the Director uh, of Elections for the Secretary of State's Elections Division here in Texas. The Secretary of State's Elections Division is responsible for unifying the application, operation, and interpretation of all election laws in Texas 
for furnishing opinions and instructions to election officials and conducting the voter registration program in the state. Ann has been a member of the Secretary of State's Elections Division since 1989. In August of 1991, she became the director of the Elections Legal Section, and in September of 1995, she became director of the Elections Division. Ann is past president of the National Association of State Election Directors and serves on the Election Assistance Commission Standards Board. She is a graduate of the University of Texas School of Law. And finally, to Ann's left is Dana de Beauvoir. Dana's heart and soul is in public service. Her interest led her to obtain a master's degree from the LBJ School of Public Affairs and ultimately to run for public office. Since her election as county clerk in 1986, Dana has devoted herself to bringing high ethical standards, effective and cost efficient management practices, the benefits of new technology, and high quality customer service to the office of the county clerk. The clerk's office has a wide range of responsibilities here in Travis County, including the conduct of elections, the filing and preservation of real property records, and the management of civil probate and misdemeanor court documents. And so with that, if you will join me in please welcoming our expert panel today. So what, the format that we will follow then for today's discussion is that we'd like to have each of the panelists uh, make opening remarks, uh, and I've told the panelists that they can talk about any issue pertaining to election administration, but that we'd like for them to focus, if possible, on the, th the theme of why we're here today, which again is about voting uh, systems and the accuracy and integrity of voting systems. Uh, but as the conversation moves forward, uh, we want to broaden out and talk about other topics besides voting system integrity, uh, but we'll go ahead and call on each panelist now to do about five minutes of introductory remarks. After that, I will moderate a discussion, uh, ask some questions, and, and moderate a discussion. And then after that, we will open it up to questions So, from the audience. So please be thinking of your questions and uh, integrity of voting systems. Uh, but as the conversation moves forward, uh, we want to broaden out and talk about other topics besides voting system integrity. Uh, but we'll go ahead and call on each panelist now to do about five minutes of introductory remarks. After that, I will moderate a discussion uh, ask some questions and, and moderate a discussion. And then after that, we will open it up to questions So, from the audience. So please be thinking of your questions. And uh, we particularly welcome the audience interaction. Uh, that's uh, something that we really want to have happen, obviously. For those of us who have students in the classroom, we uh, want to be able to use this as a mechanism to inform. So with that, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, I will. you can stay seated or you can come to the podium, whatever you're most comfortable with. I'll call on you for remarks. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call you Commissioner Martinez because when I first met uh, Ray, he was my my predecessor, and uh, I'm a little bit uh, nervous about uh, speaking about the subject that he knows so very well um, through his experience as a former commissioner. And uh, my first year, well, I've been on the commission a year and a half, so the first 14 months. Uh, <laughs> Everybody start, who had a conversation with me started with, gee, I bet you miss Ray Marshall. <laughs> and then I had to explain, well, I took his place. <laughs> so thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'll, I'll briefly go through the EAC's activities because the best part of these uh, opportunities uh, are, the, are, to me, are the Q&A. Uh, the Help America Vote Act gave the EAC responsibility for establishing the federal government's first ever uh, program to test and certify voting systems. So uh, our program is very new. Uh, most states, uh, many states, certify their own equipment. And um, previously, the National Association of State Election Directors um, developed a, a certification program that about 40 states uh, subscribed to. Our full program was launched in January of 2007. It is voluntary. The states are not required to go through our system. And uh, states can decide whether or not uh, to use uh, the EAC certification or to uh, supplement with the EA certification. They can uh, develop their own program. The EAC uh, decided not to grandfather any of the NASID uh, certified systems. And the only reason I point that out is it might come up uh, later in the discussion. That 
the effect of that decision was that all systems uh, that wanted EAC certification had to have to go through an end-to-end -end testing. Our program, uh, we believe, is, is, is fairly muscular. It's uh, modeled on U.S. and international standards, and we hold participants accountable through our quality monitoring program and our decertification option. Our program is transparent, and you can view it. Any member of the public can view the process as uh, systems move through the program by uh, tracking them on our website at eac.gov. Uh, we think that if this program is given the room to grow, um, that it will uh, be a program that, that will endure. We have not, and, and this could come up, so I'll say it first, uh, we have not certified any equipment for uh, the November 2008 election. Um, I'll get into a little bit of detail, and again, I'll, I'll be more brief probably, uh, but HAVA lays out the, pro the Help America Vote Act, which I call HAVA, and I'm sorry to use um, jingoisms, but HAVA lays out the process for us to accredit the testing labs. And uh, we work very closely with the National Institute of Standards and Technology um, in that process. And that's straight from our legislation. Um, after NIST, National Institute, recommends a system for, or a, a laboratory for certification, then we, we do our own assessment of the lab. And it's an administrative review. Currently, um, there are three accredited labs. There is a fourth that NIST has recommended for accreditation, and we're going to take that um, up at our next meeting, uh, which is October 8th. And our meetings are webcast, so um, if you have any curiosity about any of this, uh, you can. Uh, we have a library of previous meetings on our website. Um, Eleven voting system manufacturers have enrolled in our program, and eight systems have been submitted for testing. And um, correspondence to and from, ev everything um, is, again, available on our website. One thing that the EAC stresses is a uh, human element. We're not blaming the voter or the election official, but there is a human element element to elections that we try to address through our management guidelines and um, our best practices, etc. Um, voting systems have to be uh, set up uh, properly. Um, they, we, uh, we're excited to be, or I'm excited to be here be, with uh, Ms. Dana de Beauvoir because uh, she really has uh, some programs that have received national attention for uh, security. Um, the EAC really stresses the importance of logic and accuracy testing before the equipment is placed out in the field, um, and then measuring it after the election to see how, if it, if it um, performed the way that it was supposed to. And uh, I'm Delighted again to be here, and can get into any uh, length or any matter of detail that you'd like to during the Q and A on this or any other subject. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ray, for the invitation. Thank you, Ronnie, and to the Center of Politics and Governance for the invitation today. It's an honor to be up uh, on this uh, panel. I always feel like the old Sesame Street song: "One of these things is not like the other." Um, you have. Um, two former federal officials, very distinguished, and you have a state election official, you have one of the nation's finest local election officials, you have a PhD in computer scientist and someone who represents um, the big voting vendors. Um, I, my friends, I'm an election geek. Um, and so uh, let me give you just five minutes of a 30,000 foot view about voting technology and its role in elections generally, but in the 2008 elections specifically. Um, 
my background. Uh, I am here on behalf of, as Ray mentioned, um, the Pew Center on the States, um, part of the Pew Charitable Trust in Washington, D.C. I run a project called electionline.org. Um, my crew of six and I um, survey news and reports from across the country, and then working with another six or so folks in a project called Make Voting Work also support ongoing research and other, um, we hope, cutting edge thinking and election administration. Um, what I'd like to do, though, today is just give you a feel for why voting technology is so important in the 2008 uh, election. Um, there's a journalist named Steve Rosenfeld um, who said at a, a forum that we recently sponsored that um, in our secular world, elections are the closest thing to sacred in democracy. And if you think about it, democracy really is, um, if it doesn't sound too hokey, that magical moment where individuals' voices are translated into future directions for government. And any piece of that process, be it the poll workers, be it the laws, be it the technology that brings that process along is vitally, vitally important. And so the depth of expertise you're going to get from everybody else on this panel um, is going to be very important. But it's especially important this year for a reason which all of you, if you read the headlines, are very aware of, and that is staggeringly increased voter interest in the American political process. Um, we joke, um, my colleague Dan Seligson, who's an editor at Election Line, likens the current environment to the movie Jaws, um, where the shark hunters go out on the boat and for the first time encounter um, the shark rising out of the water. And Roy Scheider turns to the rest of them and says, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> well, election officials know they're going to need a bigger boat come November. And anything they can do to help voters cast their ballots on Election Day is vitally important. The reason why voting technology will play a role is because anything that impedes the process of voters through the polls has the potential to be a problem. If there's a problem at the front of the line with a voting machine or a voter list or voter ID and there are 10 people in line, that's an inconvenience. If there are 100 people, it's a problem. If there are 1,000 people, it's a crisis. And we are currently in a situation where we may see upwards of 130 million Americans casting their ballots this fall. And in that environment, every piece of the puzzle, human, legal, and technological, has to work properly and has to work in a way that the men and women who cast their ballots are confident that the system is working. So election officials are preparing feverishly. The federal government is still struggling to get astride of this issue of voting technology. Um, as is my want, I will have lots more to say um, later. Um, but for now, um, looking forward to hearing um, what the other members of the panel have to say. And again, appreciate the offer to come to Austin. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Dr. Wallet. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess if we're all geeks in this room, I'm the computer geek. My interest is in computer security. And so what that normally means is that I go around smashing things up to learn how they work and how they break. And because that's how you build things that are harder to break, because you have to you have to work on both sides of the coin. So I worked on behalf of the California Secretary of State last summer as part of her so-called top to bottom review of voting systems. Summarizing a hundred pages of written output from just the four of us in one of our groups in five minutes is impossible. And so I'll try to give you just the high, the high point, which is that all of the electronic voting machines used here in Texas and elsewhere around the country are insecure. Now, that's not terribly helpful. They are insecure in a way that makes them far more easily compromised than any other voting system, past or future, well, hopefully future. They are vulnerable to viral attacks. What that means is one voting machine, if compromised, then through the regular election procedures and, and ordinary poll workers and election officials doing the ordinary thing that they do, can spread that infection inadvertently to every voting machine in the county. That's actually a very serious concern, because keeping track of every single voting machine for every single minute of every single day ultimately requires trusting people. And if only one of them, if the failure of one machine can cause the whole system to collapse, 
then you can't trust that many people to behave perfectly. And that's where we are today. So the, what I wanted to address is, given that, it, it's just a fact, it's incontrovertible. What can we do to mitigate against these risks in the election that's coming up and in future elections? Between now and the beginning of November, there's not a lot we can do. The, the die's been cast, the machines have been bought, the procedures have been laid out, and it's not feasible to go to Dana and say, we want you to throw everything out and use this stuff instead. What do you say? It just, you, you can't do that. It's, it's the fantasy. So the question is, what can you do? The short answer is, between now and November, you just have to trust a lot of people to do the right thing and cross your fingers. It's not acceptable. It's not, it's not what you want. But really, there's not much you can do. Post-November, you know, thinking out towards 2012, there is a lot that we can do. The state of California, the state of Ohio, the state of Florida, a number of states have made radical changes to their election procedures as a result of some of these studies. It's too late for Texas this time around, but by the next time we can do a lot. We can limit these electronic voting machines to one per precinct, so that way people who need them for accessibility or you know, other reasons, they've got, they've got them, but everybody else can vote on good old-fashioned paper. Fill in the bubble, the scanner is built in onto the machine, and it can reject it for common voter errors like overvoting. In the longer term, that these kinds of hybrid schemes, such as are being required now in California, are probably what we're, where we're going to end up going. Um, the last point I want to mention is you will often hear that everything is insecure, so therefore there's no right answer, and that. That really is too simple. We need to talk about how much effort is required by somebody to, to put their thumbs on the scale and throw the election how much. If one person putting one thumb on the scale can throw the entire election, that's unacceptable. Whereas if election fraud requires a lot of people putting a lot of thumbs on the scale, well, that's better. We'd like to make election fraud as hard as possible, and we can talk about that in proportion to how much effort does it take to move how many votes. With the current generation of electronic voting machines, it's a constant effort to throw the entire election if that's what you want to do. And the logic and accuracy testing, all of that is ineffectual. Whereas with good old-fashioned paper, you have to tamper with that as many paper ballots as you want to cause to, as you want to push the election. That's harder. And that's really the big difference. So I'll leave it at that, and we can talk about more when we have questions. Thank you, Dr. Wallach. This may be the only uh, conference in the country that dares to put the voting system vendor rep right next to <laughs> the nationally known uh, critic of paperless DREs, but we do things big here, don't we, Ronnie? Uh, David, uh, Mr. Byrne, please. Uh, well, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the uh, LBJ School and the Center for Politics and Governance for inviting me. Um, as Ray mentioned, I am the Executive Director of the Election Technology Council, which together our membership comprises over 90% of the products that will be used on November 4th. Uh, our membership consists of uh, the leading uh, manufacturers currently, Election Systems and Software, Heart Inner Civic, Premier Election Solutions, and Sequoia Voting Systems. Um, as we all know, the 2008 general election is projected to be one that breaks records with turnout. Uh, it will once again place our election system, warts and all, on full public display. Uh, in recent months, various jurisdictions uh, have ordered additional voting equipment to shore up what is uh, expected to be uh, an enormous level of turnout or scheduled routine site support or maintenance through the voting system provider. Again, we know that uh, we take our role seriously in making sure that the mechanics uh, of our democracy continue to operate as they should on election day. All the leading uh, voting industry providers um, have worked to establish open lines of communication with their local election officials for both election morning and election evening when the actual tabulation process begins. Regardless of whether the technology employed is a paper-based or electronic one, it is clear that the election administration environment has progressed over recent years in light of the increased scrutiny. As confirmed time and time again, the Government Accountability Office has shown that the world of elections consists of a three-pronged stool. People, processes, and technology which interplay to document the integrity of an election. History has also shown us that no voting system is 100% foolproof. 
This is true for both paper-based and electronic voting systems. And one just side note is that all of the leading providers offer both electronic solutions as well as paper-based solutions. By the same token, well-respected computer scientists acknowledge that no software can be made 100% foolproof. If both of these assertions are acknowledged as fundamental truths, then we must acknowledge that voter confidence on our ability to confirm the integrity of an election is based on establishing a high confidence level. Our confidence level increases as election officials are able to document each step of the election process. State and local election officials have responded to academic exercises on voting systems by developing additional procedures that can be used to document the integrity of an election. As part of the Council's commitment as a resource for the elections community, we've published our document called Safeguarding the Vote, in which we outline various procedures that have been born both from the advocacy community as well as uh, election officials themselves. A few of these procedures include the use of pre and post logic and accuracy testing, which tests the actual tabulation logic to confirm the system is operating as it should. In addition, pre and post hash code testing, which tests whether the software used locally is the same as the software certified and deposited with the National Software Reference Library. Parallel testing, which involves the actual removal of voting units on election day for additional testing of each unit's tabulation logic, and finally, post election auditing. All of these procedures, when taken together, provide a high level of confidence for the election official and the public observer. As I visit with various groups around the country, I'm often asked about how we can adequately verify the performance of secret software. The notion that because the software itself is proprietary, how can I, as a layperson, uh, observe the, the inside workings of it? The notion that industry providers somehow are intent on not disclosing the software is simply not true. The leading industry providers have already deposited their software with state officials as required. They've also deposited them with the National Software Reference Library. The industry respects the role of state and local election officials to conduct their elections and certify the, the results. Although these election officials rely upon voting technology, it does not mean they abdicate the responsibility of certifying the accuracy of the election to their voting system provider. The council's, council members support disclosure of software, but it must be strictly controlled in order to protect intellectual property, which is a mainstay of the marketplace. The use of software should not be seen as a pejorative, rather it should be recognized as a third party in the tabulation process. The use of software serves the same function as a third party participant uh, in which they are hand counting paper ballots. In fact, the use of software may in, may in fact provide greater flexibility uh, for the conduct of post-election inves investigations because it can be repeatedly subjected to testing. It is clear that a segment of the population may prefer to use paper ballots. This is a choice that reflects a set of local values that a jurisdiction finds important. However, it is important to recognize that each type of voting system is unique and requires a, unit, a unique set of procedures to encapsulate it. To suggest that one type of voting technology may satisfy all the challenges confronting election officials is a gross oversimplification. Early voting, vote centers on election day, instant runoff voting, multiple language requirements, and disability accessibility are just the latest in a series of demands that mean that some sort of software-driven platform will consistently be part of our voting process. As one reporter put it to me when I asked why they don't cover the successes on election day, we don't cover safe plane, safe plane, land, plane landings. Uh, it's just simply not news. And since 2004, the members of the Election Technology Council have successfully tabulated millions of votes. When you actually look at the number of transactions available and consider each ballot option, ballot style, and language choice available to voters, the total number of transactions that have been recorded successfully easily breach the billion mark. So while you may hear of localized problems, it is important to put them in their proper context and understand the number of procedures and mechanisms, mechanisms that have been put into place to safeguard and document the integrity of the election. Again, underscoring the need or the recognition that it is a three-pronged stool of people, process, and technology. I'll be looking forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Byrd. Uh, Anne. Well, thank you very much, Ray, for the invitation. Um, the Secretary of State, I'm the Director of Elections in the Texas Secretary of State's office, and in Texas, the Secretary of State is the Chief Election Officer for the state. And what that means is we assist and advise local entities. We don't actually conduct elections. Um, but we, we assist the locals, county government like Travis County and the other um, 253 counties in the state. Um, as you know, Texas is a diverse state, so our voting system landscape is equally diverse. 
Um, we have counties, one of the smallest counties in the country, Loving County, with 116 registered voters, to Harris County with just under 2 million registered voters. Um, and they all have different voting system solutions. We have three vendors certified in the state of Texas and roughly five different configurations of voting systems, various pairings between electronic and paper um, throughout the state. As chief election officer, one of the statutory duties of the Secretary of State is to certify voting systems. Um, so the Secretary of State, um, under the prior NASED program, um, certified systems. The process in Texas is that before a vendor can get certified in the state, they have to meet federal standards. So all the systems certified in Texas meet the 2002 federal standards uh, and were tested and under a federally uh, recognized independent testing authority. Then they come to Texas and we have our own system of experts that look at these systems, in particular for things that are unique to Texas, such as straight party voting, um, some of the requirements for cumulative voting, um, voting for multiple people for the same race. Um, and we've got a group of four experts appointed, independent folks appointed by the Secretary of State and two appointed by the Attorney General. They each um, test the system, cast test ballots, ask questions of the vendors who come in to, to, to make a presentation on their system, and then they each file a written report with the Secretary of State. Secretary of State reviews that, we post them all to our website, and then we hold a public hearing. Members of the public are invited to come and give us their comments on the particular voting system, and then the Secretary determines whether to certify or not certify a system. It's actually been very quiet recently since the whole process has been transformed to the EAC. They're getting their program up and running, so we haven't seen too much activity or new systems come to be certified in the state of Texas. Um, the whole emphasis on, on electronic voting today is really a consequence of the Help America Vote Act that Commissioner Rodriguez mentioned. Um, and HAVA, of course, was a reaction to the close election in 2000. And the concern was, how can we make voting easier for voters? How can we ensure that they don't make a mistake? In addition, one of the congressional goals was to ensure that voters with disabilities could vote an independent ballot in secret. And of course, electronic voting facilitates both of those um, goals. Um, and so states um, throughout the country, now some states chose not to meet these federal uh, laws, and New York State, I think, is still bragging that they're still not HAVA compliant. But in Texas, we took that federal law very seriously, and we were in compliance by 2006. And that meant every county in the state, every one of our 8,000 plus precincts had to have at least one electronic unit in that polling place that would allow a voter with a disability to vote unassisted. Um, and so we have a combination of direct recording electronic voting systems. Those are completely electronic. There is no paper. The interface is, is basically on a computer type PC. Um, and then we have basically an electronic ballot marker. Some of our smaller counties purchase that. It's a little bit slower, but it works uh, maybe in smaller jurisdictions. Uh, and then many counties have retained their traditional paper ballots that are hand counted. Um, so you'll see quite a variety in the state of different pairings of the voting system technology. The real challenge for the state of Texas and, and really across the country was applying the existing procedures in state election codes across the country that were written very much for paper ballots and centrally counted ballots. We didn't have the machinery so much at the polling place. It was all transported to a central counting station. With HAVA, we saw a lot more electronic voting system at the precinct. Um, and it had created all its own new challenges regarding chain of custody and security. And, um, and it, was, it was tough. Many county officials, with the exception of Travis County that really is, is way ahead of the curve, um, resisted that. And they said, what? we don't have any disabled folks in this county. We don't need that electronic voting system. Um, and so it was a tough sell, but we were, the state of Texas was in compliance by January 1, 2006, and every one of those 8,000 precincts had an accessible uh, voting system in, that, uh, in, in each precinct. Um, we have had a few, our share of glitches or snafus that you see in the paper, but every one of those have been traced to a user error. These were new systems. Officials were learning how to use them. There have been no documented or proven cases of fraud. There have been some allegations, but unlike our paper ballots, where there are documented cases of manipulation of the traditional hand-counted paper, we have no documented cases uh, in Texas of fraud or manipulation. 
but we did have some mistakes. So the response, obviously, is on creating procedures to ensure the integrity of the election. And we've worked very hard to do that. Uh, like I said, the election code is a little out of date, so we've had to look at best practices across the nation. Folks like Dana um, have been leading the way. Um, in 2006, we issued our first uh, directive advisory, the Secretary of State did, on electronic voting system procedures. And they addressed things like acceptance testing, election setup and definition, voting system testing, which is key, and Dana has a lot to share there, but this includes hardware diagnostic testing, logic and accuracy testing, and post-election audit tests, which are critical to ensuring that your election goes flawlessly. If some of these kinds of tests had been conducted, some of the glitches that we have seen would have been avoided. We had to create new voting system security procedures. The fact that we've now gone to a precinct-based system means all those pieces of electronic media and electronic voting systems have to be labeled and tracked and an inventory kept for all of that. Um, and then, of course, we have to have disaster recovery plans. And all of this falls upon, um, you know, we've got a federal level, a state level, and then it goes down to the county. And with our great variety of counties, we have many county officials in the state, it usually falls to the county clerk to administer the electronic voting system. Uh, and many times that's a single individual in a county. Uh, they may get help during election seasons from other offices, but it's a huge um, amount of, of work and responsibility uh, on, a, on a very small office. From the state's point of view, we've been concentrating on training. We have uh, seminars every summer where, that are very well attended by all the counties. We have user workshops. And I was very proud to say that we had our third round of user workshops this summer. And for the first time, we really saw counties from across the state really sharing good best practices with each other on chain of custody suggestions, on getting your security labels um, placed on, on the equipment properly. So I think that that learning curve um, is really, has really increased, and our county officials are much more comfortable with this new technology. And then last thing I was going to mention on the training is that the Secretary of State has a new online um, poll worker training. This is designed not for the county officials, but the people actually manning the polls at the polling place. And we just recently added a voting system component to it. So for every one of those five different configurations of voting systems, we've got a very simple little video in there that shows how to open up the polls, how to vote voters, and how to close polls. So that with this electronic voting system, all officials are having some kind of training. That's a basic overview, and I'll, I'll be happy as the other panelists to address questions later. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Dana Debrevoir. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. And as any good professor who's trying to teach you something, and what I'd like to do is point out what Professor Martinez has done here with this panel. What he's, what he's showed before you here is all the various roles that are needed in order to make elections work. Starting at the federal level, since we now have the Help America Vote Act, um, starting with the EAC, setting um, uh, st uh, standards and guidelines for voting systems, um, and procedures and rules for states to adopt, and they have accomplished a lot of work, a fledgling agency in a very short period of time. Um, and, then, and then we start moving towards the state level. Um, and, uh, and we have the vendor's role included here. And, and if you heard our vendor representative talking about, Mr. Byrne talked about the fact that the election companies now include their software in a national library uh, for, for election codes that are held in escrow. That's all very important. And then to the state level, and again refer to the requirements of the state. Um, uh, the, the state in Texas is the, is the entity among all these roles that we play responsible for certifying any equipment that can be sold in the state of Texas that can be used for our citizens to vote on. So you can see the roles are all, they're distinct and they're clear, uh, but we also overlap with one another. It's, it is a, um, uh, we can't, one, we, we need all of our election geeks up here. And then finally, when it gets to the local level, um, you have the county clerk typically who's in the position of actually delivering, uh, you know, a hard program on the ground. So by the time we get to this far into the table, we're talking really nuts and bolts and how can I make it work in the most practical way possible. So thank you, Professor Martinez, for demonstrating that we, you know, we, elections is hardly simple and we've got a lot of people involved in it. 
Um, I guess the, the one byword I would use for, for being a local practitioner responsible for actually delivering to voters is that when looking at operating our uh, electronic voting system, what I would say is um, we don't trust, we test. Um, and I, I would like to go over some of what that means because I've studied with years with a lot of election geeks and a lot of wonderful software security engineers, including Dr. Wallach, who've taught me a lot about how to implement their what, what you would normally think of as their, their pickiness uh, into the real world and how can we make sure that these systems are as safe as possible have we thought through everything that might happen. About eight years ago, the LBJ School helped me host um, a diverse and representative panel of citizens from our local area, uh, and their assignment was to study all of the various different kinds of voting systems that were out there and pick the one that was best suited uh, for Travis County. The panel, after reviewing everything, unanimously recommended the Hart InterCivic eSlate system that we use here today. And among the items that that panel considered is that, first of all, we wanted the county to be completely independent from the vendor, especially when it comes to programming or setting up uh, each ballot for its election day use. Um, we also preferred a touch button system over a touch screen system when the issues back when we were purchasing also touched on many calibration concerns. So there were some, some technical issues. Um, we didn't want any connection whatso all to, whatsoever to the internet, and the system that we had is not in any way connected to the internet. Uh, we liked the fact that it had three-level multiple, multiple audit capability, and that the fact that our um, uh, abled and disabled voters voted exactly the same, no matter what, was a very heartwarming thing to watch, and it was the right thing for America to do. Um, and that, the group of that panel of citizens, Democrats and Republicans and election judges and you know, just all kinds of folks from this community paid off because this, we've been using now this eat system for the last seven years in Travis County. And we've learned a lot along the way. We've been vigilant in our efforts to make sure that Travis County's election processes um, have implemented as many of these security procedures as we've heard about as we travel around and talk to our fellow election geeks around the country. Um, we've implemented security practices that utilize, and, and I'm going to start from the very simplest to the most complex. We literally um, util utilize locks and keys and, and how incredibly important physical security is. Passwords, security cameras filming um, all of the important tests tamper-resistant seals and containers. We strictly limit access to programming and equipment. We do criminal background checks on employees. And Travis County won a national award for its computer security testing program in which we touch every single solitary piece of equipment with a variety of tests, which include logic and accuracy testing, hash code testing, and, and parallel monitoring. And what we're beginning to see, Travis County's been doing these for tests for about two years now, what we're beginning to see is that it's becoming then the, the, the approach nationally in other counties. This seems to be the way to go to, for electronic voting to make sure that you've done the testing that will cover enough of an area of potential risks that you can reach a confidence level that says, yes, this machine is going to perform in public the way it was designed to in its test mode. Uh, and while most of the voters, the vast majority of voters in this particular county love East Light voting and think it's very easy to use, we have been asked often here about why we don't have some kind of a paper system. Most commonly we're asked about a paper receipt. And th the answer is that we, there are places where you can add paper to the existing systems. But for Texas, that is not legal. Uh, we're the, those kinds of systems have not been certified for use in the state of Texas yet. Now, for the future, uh, we can certainly look at systems that, are, that have a paper added to them or that simply replace what we have with something else that is paper-based. That's entirely doable. Um, I do not, however, think that the suggestion that we should go with um, in addition to a, 
a paper ballot that we should also go with a hand tally is appropriate for a jurisdiction our size. I just don't think that's a, a, a responsible, from a preserved per person in my position, a responsible thing to say to voters that I can count your, va your ballot accurately and quickly and get you results back with any kind, with, without electronic help. Um, and I do think that this issue is going to come up further and further as we go through November, which is going to be wonderful and overwhelming. It's going to be the biggest thing you've ever seen. It, it may very well be the largest election that I have the honor to conduct in my entire career. We are so looking forward to it with a, you know, a, a little bit of fear and a whole lot of excitement because I, I think it's going to be gigantic. Um, when we purchased uh, our particular electronic voting system in this community, um, we knew that it had a useful life of approximately 10 or 12 years, perhaps longer, and it certainly held up well over the seven years that we have been using it. Um, but over the last couple of years, this community has been talking about, well, for the future, um, you know, at some point we're going to need to talk about our next generation of voting systems. And so we had picked quite some time back, the year 2009, to be talking about, all right, well, what would be best for our community for the future? And we still plan to convene another representative citizens panel uh, during 2009 to start that process so that we will be ready. And one of the things that certainly the panel will consider is, do we want all electronic? Do we want some sort of a hybrid, which is used in a lot of places that combines uh, paper and electronic? Those issues will be very carefully considered. Um, what I would, you know, from my perspective of, of actually delivering whatever system we design at the federal and state level to the voters in this area, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that whatever we use is something that you can prove up as accurate, really easy to use for the voters and, and continues to provide accessible elections for our advocacy community. And I'd like to thank the LBJ School not only for graduating me from, from there quite a few years ago um, and helping me with the selection process in the past for a new voting system, but for their, their, their uh, anticipated help in the future, for hosting this today al along with the Center for Politics and Government and for allowing me to be in the company of a group of very fine election geeks. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Dana. Well, uh, there's no question we have assembled a terrific panel. Uh, with great expertise. I myself have a few questions, uh, so we'll jump into that in just a second. Let me on a note of personal privilege to say how much I appreciate um, that folks have taken the time to be here, both those who have traveled perhaps just across town to be here, like Ann and Dana, but also those who have traveled across the country, uh, or across the state for that matter. Um, I'm personally appreciative. I, I know most of these individuals very well from my time uh, serving on the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Uh, and. Uh, I'm just uh, very appreciative that y'all would make the time to be here and offer your perspective. With that, I want to start with a, a general question, and there are, as far as I know, two of our panelists uh, are uh, attorneys, or at least have law degrees, as I do myself, so I figured I would start by picking on the lawyers. Uh, <laughs> so Mr. Chapin, uh, there is, uh, going to electionline.org today, there is one of your top stories is a headline did Washington waste millions on faulty voting machines? And it's a big, I think it's a big AP story that you have taken from one of uh, the local newspapers from around the country. Uh, did Washington waste millions on faulty voting machines? Let's just start with that question. What do you think? I, it's an interesting question. I think that what the, just a very quick history lesson for those of you who aren't privy. Um, when, uh, after the 2000 presidential election, there was a fairly animated debate at many levels of government across the country, but especially on Capitol Hill about how to respond. And the, the, the eventual response was the Help America Vote Act of 2002, or HAVA. And HAVA was significant for a variety of reasons. Um, probably the most um, of which was the fact that for the first time ever, the federal government was investing federal money in state and local election administration of federal elections, promising nearly $4 billion in funds to help with voting machine upgrades uh, and other studies to improve the process. Um, that's the good news. Um, the, the not as clear news was that the federal government gave states deadlines in making some of these upgrades. So you had federal money, which is helpful. You had federal mandates, which states and localities aren't always crazy about. And then you had a facility for providing guidance to states and localities, specifically the Election Assistance Commission, 
but because of circumstances, um, the EAC had a very difficult birth, and I'll let the two commissioners tell you more about that. But because of that, the money came, the mandates came first, then came the money, and then what guidance there was, very little, um, came last. So as a result, states and localities were almost literally flying blind when it came to what kind of machines to buy. The only guidance that HAVA gave to states and localities was that one voting machine per precinct needed to be accessible to voters with disabilities, and the language was such as a direct recording electronic machine or a touchscreen machine. In the absence of any other guidance, many jurisdictions decided to take that mandate for one DRE and treat it as, well, if the, if the government is blessing DREs as the disabled voting machine, maybe we should buy them as the line voting machine. Um, I will leave it to um, Professor Wallach and Mr. Byrne to talk a little bit about the subsequent history. But basically, the Help America Vote Act is a classic example of Congress trying to do the right thing, but then giving the people actually responsible for the job um, very little guidance as to how to accomplish it. Um, there's an old joke in Washington um, that goes that the two things that Congress I think about this when I read about the bailout news today. The two things that Congress is better than than anything else is doing nothing and overreacting. Um, and I think that what we're now seeing in 2008 is some difference of opinion as to whether or not Congress did not enough in advancing voting technology in this country, or maybe in some weird way did too much by giving states and localities federal money that they felt they had to spend without giving them sufficient guidance and how to do it. But I think a lot of the frustration you see with that that's embodied in that AP story and that we see across the country is a direct result of sort of that toxic brew of lots of federal money with very little federal guidance. So, Anne, I just wonder from your perspective, uh, being the recipient of the funds that were coming down from the EAC when I was on the commission, actually, um, your, your thoughts, did Congress overreact? Would it have been more prudent from a policy perspective to uh, set a target or a goal and not uh, and not be so prescriptive as perhaps they were uh, in Hobbit. Right. Well, I, I think it was definitely a, a, a double-edged sword. I mean, clearly, I think the states didn't have enough time in the counties because in addition to what we're talking about right now, which is voting systems, it had another huge mandate, and that was to go to a statewide voter registration list maintained by the state. So states were really struggling to get this all done, and, and, and as Doug Chapin said, with very little guidance. But on a positive side, I do think that it has helped to professionalize a little bit the field of elections. It's definitely made it harder, but at the same time, it's made for a little more consistency. The fact that we are reaching disabled voters and allowing them to vote independently, um, Texas happened to be sued on that issue in the early 90s, so it happens to be sensitive, um, a sensitive topic. But that's a great step forward to mandate that. And that probably was never going to happen unless Congress said it had to happen and it had to happen by a certain deadline. Um, at the same time, uh, Texas is a big early voting state, which is being promoted nationally by, by the you know, uh, voting advocates as a way of preventing long lines on election day. And electronic voting really facilitates that. Um, I think Florida is experimenting now with ballots on demand. We'll see how that works. Um, but for several reasons, you know, providing foreign language, different uh, minority uh, languages on the ballot, there's some definitely some positives. But, but no doubt about it, I think we could have used more time um, to develop those procedures. Thank you. Um, so uh, when I start teaching my uh, class at the beginning of the semester, my election law class at the LBJ school, I pose a series of uh, true or false questions. And one of the questions that I posed to the class this semester was just to, you know, get the get uh, folks thinking about some of these issues. Most of my students really come with no preparation in terms of thinking about the mechanics of our elections. And one of the true or false questions is uh, the the federal government certifies all voting systems in the country to ensure their accuracy and integrity. Uh, and most of my students said, of course, true. That that was a, a true. Uh, that the answer to that question was true. Um, but it's not. So, Commissioner Rodriguez, can you shed some light then on what exactly, I know you talked about it in your opening comments, but what exactly is the role of the Election Assistance Commission, which was, after all, created after the Florida 2000 presidential election? Uh, what, what role does the federal government play in ensuring that our voting systems are functioning properly on Election Day? 
Thank you, Commissioner Martinez, for that question. Um, the spirit of HAVA um, was um, to, uh, I think, uh, place a, ver a, a light touch on how the states administer and, and local governments administer elections. So uh, the Congress offered the funds, and then um, and there are some some requirements associated with the funds. But when it came to the actual uh, programs that 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 are mandated in Hava for us to develop, uh, the uh, the federal uh, the Congress, I I I believe. Um, gave the states and local government wide, wide uh, discretion in whether or not they want to um, avail themselves of programs like the voting system um, guidelines, adopting those. I mean, it's completely up to the states, and I believe what Congress was attempting to do was honor the, the local nature of, of election administration. Um, so just sort of a parenthetical comment uh, whenever I have to explain our system to foreigners and we, we meet with a lot of uh, delegations who are studying US elections it, it's it's just a mystery our system is a mystery to them because uh, so many of, of their systems are, are you know seriously centralized and here we are with our are disaggregated uh, I think that's one of the things that prevents fraud. I, I agree with uh, Dr. Wallach. I mean, it's a lot harder to cheat a system when you don't know what's happening, not only from state to state, but from county to county. So the EAC, uh, I don't think we're in a position to promote, uh, to go around promoting our program as um, the, uh, the, the be-all and end-all that I hope it will become because it's in the development system. And we have to um, establish our own uh, um, our own relationships with these states. And I, I don't think they're in a position to, to want to subscribe uh, completely with our, our guidelines yet. Now, some of them may be, but, but most of them aren't, because we're still proving our program. And so. Uh, Someday your students um, might have a, an answer to that question that, that reaches what I, I hope is an ideal, and that is a robust federal program, muscular, um, and, and the gold standard, but uh, we're in the development stages. And I should also clarify before I move on to the next question that I think I said that the federal government doesn't certify. Eventually they will. Eventually you're trying to get to the point where you will certify voting systems, but, but it's, it is not, it's not a requirement that, that states have to, com have to uh, participate in the EAC system, certification system. Now, as I think Ann might have touched upon, as a matter of state law, many states have actually codified, if you will, or, or pass laws or regulations that say before a vendor can actually sell their system in one of our local jurisdictions, they're going to have to have a seal of approval from the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, my understanding is that the EAC is not yet in a position to give that seal of approval, or hasn't done so yet. Uh, but eventually it will, but the fact of the matter is that the way our system is set up, um, there is not a requirement, a mandatory requirement for states to participate in federal certification. They could choose to retract these laws and just conduct their own state certification without a federal certification process. So, Professor Wallach, I wonder, is, is the certification process itself something that lends to mm -hmm. the uncertainty, perhaps the uh, insecurity that some people have about the systems? If we can't have uh, confidence in the process that we use um, to ensure the accuracy and integrity of our systems, um, where do we start then? It's an interesting question. Prior to the California and Ohio studies of last year, the certification was was all we had, and we were asked to trust that this process that outside nobody really understood how it worked, 
we said, well, it's they, they would tell us, it's certified, trust us, it's, it's all good. Then the California Secretary of State commissioned a bunch of people to have a closer look, and I was part of that. And what we found, I mean, never mind that we found that these voting machines had security holes, what we found was that these are, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit that was easy for us to find that had somehow sailed through the certification process. If you read even the 2002 voting standards, which are now obsolete, but they're what all of our voting machines are certified to, the standards say machines should be secure. They don't go into much more detail than that, but it's in the standards. And a cursory examination would have found these security problems, which leads us to ask the question, did the certification do anything? Was it meaningful at all? And that's, I think that there, we don't have a good answer to even that question. I think in the future, with a more, more transparency in the process, certification could play a very important role nationwide. I think that voting machines with, that are designed better than the ones that are on the market today, combined with a certification process that's more open and more transparent than the one today, could do a lot to bring back the voter confidence that we need. Uh, David Byrne, from the industry perspective, is there, does, the, does the certification system that we currently have, is it functional? Uh, the one we currently have is not functioning. Uh, and one of the real dangers, and actually as an industry, we're, on, we're in an interesting position because we actually recommend or, and want to see a strong federal standard that all of the states opt into. Uh, and the one, one of the main reasons being is that it's a very small marketplace. And, and at the end of the day, there's only approximately 3,500 customers who are going to be interested in purchasing a voting system. And as an industry, if we're interested, or even a, a new provider, uh, someone who wants to dominate the marketplace with a, a new revolutionary product, one of the concerns we have in, as, a, as an industry trade association is keeping barriers low for both current and potentially new providers. And uh, if you have all the states opt into the federal certification framework, you immediately build in cost efficiencies if you're able to certify your system and therefore sell it in 50 states as opposed to 10. Uh, if we see more and more states grow frustrated because effectively in the last two years, the industry has been uh, unable to release software upgrades with the exception of those states or, or local jurisdictions who have built in an exemption to bypass their own requirement for federal certification. So uh, as anyone recognizes within an industry, you want to make sure that you're pushing out your, your software upgrades. And where we find ourselves now is that we cannot, there's a bottleneck, and we, really, we truly respect that the EAC process is a, a work in progress. Unfortunately, from, an, from a marketplace perspective, uh, we're seeing cost increase. Uh, we're not sure what the timeline is for when the products are going to be certified. And at the end of the day, uh, in that type of environment, the taxpayers are going to be the ones who suffer not only costs, but in the timeliness of receiving product upgrades. Yeah. I, I just, I, I just, I'm just to clarify, just the situation we have right now is that the federal standards are voluntary. But that's, they're voluntary in that, um, that, that, that vendors have the option whether or not to, um, to comply with them. But in the vast majority of states, state law makes those voluntary standards mandatory. So you can call them voluntary, but they're not voluntary. So the current state of affairs is that we have system, we have system standards which are in the process of evolving. We have state laws requiring that vendors test to those standards in order to sell in their states. And we've got vendors who want to provide and market upgrades to their existing systems that they can't. And so we see again and again across the country jurisdictions, not just jurisdictions that are going from paper to electronic, but states that want to go the other way, that want to go from electronic to paper-based systems or want to upgrade, upgrade their paper-based systems who can't because the upgrade hasn't been certified. And so what we've got is a, is a market where whatever function there is for innovation simply isn't functioning. Dana, any thoughts from a local perspective about uh, when your machines do have to uh, go through some sort of an upgrade? Is there a problem? I think there's a lull in the marketplace right now for, for good products to buy, unfortunately. And, and it, this is relevant to this local jurisdiction because our plan all along had been to use 2009 to go into the marketplace and start researching for our next generation of equipment. Well. If the marketplace can't deliver us products that our citizens like here, 
you know, then there's simply nothing that we can purchase. I mean, at, le at least we have those regulations and those checks and, uh, and balances in place. Um, so what I, what I would say is um, I, I also appreciate what the what the AEIC is trying to do and the fact that Texas codified um, that federal law. So it, it is now mandatory state law for us here as well. Um, I'm, I'm still, I still believe in American ingenuity and what people can come up with. And I think that once we get the November election um, kind of through, I, I think there will be an opportunity for everybody to redirect their attention and their resources back to the, you know, the sort of the back burner business of we need, we need product development, we need more research and development, we, we need more testing protocols, we need to figure out post uh, election, election testing protocols. All of that work needs to be, get, be done, and I think, I think not to consider this huge election, you know, not to recognize that it's taking up a lot of resources right now is kind of silly after this is over with, and I think we can do some serious work in getting this product um, line going again. Okay. Well, sticking with Dana then, uh, Dana, during your opening remarks, you, you said that we don't trust, we test. If your voting machines in Travis County could talk, they'd probably be complaining, my, is my guess, because <laughs> Um, I, I believe you do acceptance testing, you do uh, pre and post logic and accuracy testing. I, I don't know, it. you may do some parallel monitoring uh, at times and perhaps some post election audit uh, as well. Um, talk about whether Travis County is the norm or, or are you the exception in how you, uh, the, the protocols toward handling your paperless DRE systems? Right. Um, and again, at the Secretary of State's and I, uh, office and I have talked about this issue. Um, we're, we do more testing than probably most uh, counties you will hear of. I, I think that's rapidly changing and growing. One of the things that we did when we, when we kind of figured out the way to describe a lot of, um, let, let me just start with, a, a, a lot of times people will say to you, well, I'm just worried about something, you know, and I don't know exactly what it is. Well, it's difficult to write a procedure that will capture, you know, that, that will make that will make that situation better when you really don't know what you're working with. So what we've had to do is go through and, and literally specifically l label out in every single county the kinds of risks that you truly might see depending on which kind of system you have and what mitigator did you put in place to take care of that risk. And it, now that we're getting down to the the nut, not just the nuts and bolts, but the actual detail. Uh, following a risk assessment and getting these these concerns more defined and more logical has has paved the way for other institutions, other jurisdictions to adopt these policies as well. And it does look like that the the triumvirate of the te of the tests that we use, and there there are a bunch of tests that come under these three different categories. But basically, uh, logic and accuracy testing, which has been around for what since post World War II, something like that, sometime in the 50s. Logic and accuracy testing, both before and after. Hash code testing, which is relatively new, but, but a, 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 a test for jurisdictions to easily pick up and take to heart and, and actually make work. And then mon uh, parallel monitoring, which is one of the more difficult and expensive tests to do. And we've done it here for quite some time. And, and the way we do parallel monitoring is that it is done every single day of early voting and election day as well. Now that's that's a lot of testing to ask a smaller jurisdiction to undertake. But I, I think that's the direction that we're all being called to. That's going to be the new standard is that those are the tests we're going to use for the future. And then I think we've already started to talk about about, well, what are we going to do post-election? Is Are the tests that we're using right now adequate enough? Do we need more? Should we think about um, other kinds of uh, protections or detections that we want to put into it? Those conversations have yet to be had, and all of that's going to, all of those conversations are going to resurge again right after the November election. So, Dr. Wallach, in your opening statement, you talked about mitigating um, risk, and it sounds like there are some efforts going on in a jurisdiction that we sit in here that I actually reside in and vote in myself, Travis County, where efforts are being made to mitigate that risk. Your comments about about those efforts and whether it, if no voting system can, can mitigate risk down to a zero percent, are, are we getting to an acceptable level when you hear about some of these protocols being put in place like uh, Travis County? I think the procedures that, that we see here in Travis County would be wonderful to see exported more broadly across the state and they're a great start. What they are not is protection against election fraud. 
they're mostly a way of verifying that the machines are operating correctly on a good day. The logic and accuracy testing is something that the machine knows it's being tested. So if the machine had been tampered with, it could behave properly while under testing and then continue to be fraudulent otherwise. The parallel testing that Dana discussed really is a much more involved and detailed procedure where if you have 100 precincts, you have 102 precincts worth of machines and you pull two of them at random out and say you're off to the lab on election day. So that means even if the machines were watching the clock, they're being tested on election day with voters, well, but as far as the machine can tell, it's real voters and the machine doesn't know it's being tested. That can capture a fair amount of fraudulent machine behavior if it's there. Not all. And it's an open question of whether I could design evil fraudulent software that could figure out that it was being tested versus whether it was being used in the field. That's actually an interesting open question. That gets us closer. There's a whole future generation of voting systems where you can test the machines on the fly in the field in the precinct that use some fairly sophisticated cryptographic mechanisms. This, you know, the research for this is 20 years old but actually getting software built that behaves this way is fairly new. I mean, we built one system at Rice, it's open source. I was talking to the Hart representative earlier saying, please, let's talk about how you can use some of our stuff in your machine. So there are future techniques that might be able to really revolutionize the way machines are tested and fraud can be detected on the fly. But right now, that's not available in any commercial product. And uh, McGeehan, the, uh, I know nationwide that there has been, uh, over the past two years or so, a drift away from paperless electronic machines toward either optical scan or DREs that have a paper trail component to it. I wonder if you could, so I think across the country, the latest numbers I've seen, um, something like a third of the voters across the country, Doug, you can correct me, uh, will, will vote on paperless DREs and roughly 50% uh, will vote on optical scan or a paper-based voting system or the rest of the rest are paper-based voting systems, essentially. Um, and, and I don't know how those numbers break out in Texas. I know that you mentioned we have a, uh, a smattering of different types of voting systems here in Texas. Do, do you have numbers that tell us how many voters will, uh, in Texas will, will use uh, DRE systems and versus paper-based systems? Uh, well, let me see. I did bring some statistics with uh -huh. me. I don't know if I have that exact answer. Let's see. We have... Um, 220 of our 254 counties use uh, some kind of optical scan okay. uh, voting system. Um, now, all counties use at least one kind of electronic accessible device. So it's either a DRE or it's the Automark, which is basically kind of a DRE face, but it actually produces a, a paper ballot. So all counties use, use one or the other. Um, what, I, what I would say about Texas is that it has resisted, you know, California, Dr. Wallach has mentioned, Florida, Ohio, Colorado, have all done their own internal tests, which is admirable. But I guess from, from just viewing it from, from the outside, you see each county, each state attacking it a little differently and identifying a different series of risks. So California found a set of problems based on the risks that they were identifying. Colorado found something different. Ohio found, they all came with different conclusions. I believe the conclusion in Ohio was to go to a central count optical scan. Florida's gone to a precinct count optical scan. So I think one of the big challenges right now and for the EAC as well is, is before we can certify, before a vendor can build this next system, we need to decide well, what is the level of risk that we can live with. And we have to look at it, you know, as, as a whole. Um, so I think it's, Right now, it's a little frustrating being an election official because there is a lot of press about, well, why aren't you doing what they did in California? What? But the thing is, we have to put it in perspective. Um, and you can, if you look at a voting system by itself, if we brought in a voting system in this room and asked somebody to hack into it, they probably could. But that's not an election situation. You don't have your checks and balances that you would, that Dana has on election day. So I think that's, that's really a very important question, is defining that risk because before we define that, we need to define that before we set the next set of guidelines. That, that really we should have done. Um, NIST did a cursory review for...
what what kind of what's your threat matrix? What what are you guys um, measuring as as risk to these systems? And of course, we uh, had to uh, do an RFP, and that's currently um, in place now. Almost a year later, I, I'm a little bit ashamed to say that uh, the federal contracting process um, uh, is cumbersome to say the least. But uh, we're, we're um, pretty excited about uh, what we're uh, about to embark on and so that we can provide that kind of guidance, uh, first of all, to inform our own program, but then also the states. Uh, I just wanted to add a few things, um, and I might be slaughtering the statistics, but I believe it's 45.1 percent of registered voters that are will be using DREs, and 50. I think it's just over 50 percent are using actually optical scan or paper ballots. Uh, Is that that's, nationwide? That's nationwide. Ah, okay. Um, but my apologies to Kim Brace at Election Data Services if that's incorrect. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on as well is that really what you're hearing a lot of is the challenges of operating in a marketplace in which you have shifting demands. So let me give you a couple of examples. One in which Dr. Wallach participated in California top to bottom review, but there was another review done in Ohio in which their targets are no longer limited just to electronic voting units. Uh, we've now seen a shift to also start targeting paper-based voting, including precinct-based counting or tabulators, and whether or not they are also subject to certain security threats. And so the question that is difficult for anyone in this environment is to say, what is the acceptable level of confidence that must be established? Um, there's a number of areas I disagree with Dr. Wallach on, but fundamentally I think we can agree that we're trying to pursue a high confidence level, and the question is, what is that level? Um, but certainly if you're start, if every single voting system is being subjected to uh, a high threshold or a low tolerance level for any type of security risk, um, it makes it a very fluid environment for how to develop a product that is satisfactory uh, for all of the, the stakeholders. And I think that's what we're seeing is that uh, between the, the newest draft of voting system standards, we're on our currently, I think it's our fourth or potentially fourth draft in six years. And from a, a development standpoint, for new product development, you're looking at a time window of 54 months, which brings it from point of inception all the way out to the marketplace. That's four and a half years. So that's, that's the long-term growth, and that's the long-term prognosis. The question is, you know, when is the market going to stabilize? When are all of the key stakeholders going to come together and say, here's the acceptable threat model. And I know the EAC is working on that, and that's what we look forward to, to receiving as well from the industry perspective, because that will help us understand more of what is the, the consensus, what are we striving for, and so we can build our products accordingly. Thank you. Okay, I'll invite any uh, audience uh Questions, if anybody has any questions from the audience. Uh, yes, ma'am, uh, in the back there. All of you, Dr. Wallach is, I believe, the only one who's actually reviewed software. Let's talk about Hart for a moment. And his concerns, as he has mentioned, are that as, as uh, thorough as the testing is that Dana does, and we have, uh, at Vote Rescue, which I'm a part, have acknowledged her for leading the pack of county election officials for being as careful as one can be and having additional testing that's not done in most parts of the country. Nonetheless, the fact is that Dr. Wallach has reviewed the software and his concerns are that none of those types of testing could really catch all the different types of fraud that could occur. So that's a major concern I have and that many of us have here in Travis County and across the country. So my question is, I guess, and also related to that, I would like to add, I'd like to ask Ann McGeehan um, about, let's see, in March of, of this year, a federal fraud lawsuit against Hart Inner Civic was unsealed, and there were a number of issues that were raised by a former programmer for Hart that were summarized by, I guess you would say, summarized in two major points that there are a number of security issues that he uh, acknowledged that he saw and found during his several years as a programmer for Hart and that Hart uh, salespeople misrepresented the product to election officials who had not seen the software in order to sell it with HABA money and to gain that HABA money. I understand that some questions on this that we have been trying to get answers for got passed up to the Secretary of State's office and I was wondering if you had responded to those and I was wondering why are we still being uh, uh, why are we still using touch screen type technology in Texas when those who have reviewed it say that it is not safe and, and it and it is uh, subjected to can be subjected to undetectable tampering no matter what type of testing is being done 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Anne, uh, any, any comment to, to that? Uh, well, I think I heard two questions. Um, the first one it relates to a lawsuit that an ex-employee of Hard Inner Civic filed. Um, and as I understand, uh, he has concerns that uh, the law was violated. When he first contacted our office, uh, soon after he left the company, there was no evidence of any uh, fraud. I know he pursued it. Uh, he's now filed a, a civil lawsuit, um, and I'm not sure where that is at. Um, so that, you need to go through the courts on that. Um, uh, the second question on touch screens uh, is yes, there are some experts, computer experts, have, have looked at um, DRE voting systems and have deemed it unsafe. But again, that's according to, to, to their rules that they've developed. I mean, the thing is, we're all talking about maybe the next evolution in voting systems, but the reality is, you know, an election comes every year the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So election officials have to work with the rules we have in place. And so the systems in Texas were certified at the federal level. They were certified in the state level. Could they be better? Probably. I'm sure we can always improve, but we've followed the rules that are set up. And, and I guess that was, I'm going back to my previous comment, is, is you've, one thing about elections is it's got to be open, it's got to be transparent, you've got to know what the rules are. So if you're always changing the rules, you know, that's not good for voters, that's not good for anybody. Um, I, I, those are my comments. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Uh, uh, Dr. Wallach, uh, any comments about, uh, you know, the criticism that, that top to bottom reviews are done in, in uh, laboratory conditions versus um, the actual uh, climate, if you will, of an election day or an early election day or an early voting day for election officials? Yeah, I find that criticism baffling. I've heard it in several different places. It showed up in, in from several of the vendor representatives at the recent hearing in front of the Texas House Committee on Elections. It's just false. When we analyzed these voting machines, we were asking what could an attacker in the field with access that real attackers in the field would have, what could such an attacker accomplish? The only assumption we made that you might challenge is that our attacker already knew how the machines work. In this case, you know, we read the source code to the voting machines, so we knew how they worked. So then we could posit that an attacker walks in knowing what the vulnerabilities are and merely has to take advantage of them because they're present. Otherwise, I mean, if you read our report, we have a whole chapter titled Threat Model. We talked about that in detail. We talked about tamper evidence seals and the amount of effort necessary to get around them. It's all in there. So any claim that we didn't look at that is simply false. Thank you. Uh, uh, right. uh, go ahead, Dave. Yes. Uh, just a couple of things. I mean, when you're looking at, when you have access to software source code, right there, that is a model that's not really indicative of the average person that's not involved directly in the process coming into the polling place and what access or level of knowledge that they have. And that's something that, that's where you have the academic pursuit, which is for knowledge for knowledge's sake, which we certainly respect versus the actual practitioner exercise in which you're looking at a real-world environment. And although this is not, I don't think this was cited in, in Dr. Wallach's report, but it's indicative of the academic pursuit, which is fine for driving new product development standards, but it's important to put it in, in its proper context. One of the things you hear a lot about is denial of service attacks. And one denial of service attack that's positive, and I believe this was, in, again, in the Ohio report, uh, was whether or not you could disconnect a cable from the back of a voting machine. The question is, yes, you certainly can. Is that a denial of service attack? Well, yes, I suppose it is. Is it detectable? Yes, it is. And so they do level the risks accordingly, low, medium, or high, and it's important to gauge them uh, with the relative you know, uh, severity. But when you're dealing with a threshold such as that being a type of denial of service attack, which calls into question the integrity of the equipment, that's the slippery slope that we're dealing with and trying to develop some sort of measure of consensus uh, and moving forward. And just one last note, um, the last time Dr. Walk and I, I think, appeared together was uh, on the PBS uh, station, or local news. One of the local news stations. Local news program. And uh, afterwards, I received a phone call from uh, their spokesperson from one of the testing laboratories in which I had described uh, how they looked at source code. And one of the big issues that they look at is whether or not the source code is functional. Uh, they're not necessarily looking at it from an academic standpoint to say, is it the best written code I've ever seen? No. They're looking at, is the code functional? Does it perform as it should? And that's where they, they draw the line with their system review. Uh, the way he put it to me, that was the best description I've heard. Again, my background is not as a computer scientist, but that's my understanding of how the test laboratories pursued it, was to say, is it functioning as it should? 
not to say whether or not to pass judgment on whether or not it is the best code that's ever been written for that application. Thank you, Dave. Can I respond to that? Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, Dr. Wong. So the, there, there's an interesting point that was first discussed back and forth by the people designing locks, which is, should we assume that the rogues, the thieves, know how locks work? You know, should, and this principle was sort of established long before there were such a thing as a computer, that we should design locks in such a way that even if you know exactly how it works, you know how the tumblers work, you know everything about the mechanism, is if you don't know the key, you can't, you can't pick the lock. It's called Kirchhoff's principle, and it's the, fa it's the bedrock of how you do security. We should assume that the attacker knows how the machine works because it's an incredibly fragile world if, to, 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 to build your security on the absence of that. Even without source code, it's a safe assumption that an attacker can arrange for a voting machine to fall off the back of a truck. This can happen, probably already has. You can buy some of these machines on eBay. And reverse engineering a machine is not that hard. It's just additional effort. So claiming that what we did is an academic exercise divorced from reality is false. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, of course. I want to just take a moment and say, can't we all just get along? And I really hope that voters who are listening to this discussion are in no way uh, inhibited or afraid or concerned about going to vote. We have a lot of work to do in the election administration field and with respect to technology and systems and everything, but I don't want anybody to be discouraged from participating. Um, it's, it, we're working on it, but please, please, please participate. Thank you. <laughs> so we have time for a little bit more audience participation. Uh, yes, sir. Uh -huh. Yeah, first I'd like to thank Ronnie and the center for having such a distinguished panel. You guys are impressive. Uh, I've been an election judge, an assistant election judge, and worked in elections for Dana and the county for a while. So I know a little bit about the process, and to me, uh, simplicity and security are the two key issues. And so I guess my question to all of the panelists is, why don't we go to mail-in ballots like Oregon has, like we do with our overseas voters, like we do with many early voters in Texas? What are the issues there, and why can't we do mail-in ballots? Uh, Doug Chapin, why doesn't what works for Oregon work for a state like Texas? Why well, does it? I, well, I tell you, what's interesting, and this is um, when I'm not talking about issues like this, the current um, topic du jour is early and absentee voting. Um, early voting, Americans are voting with their feet, and they are walking away from polling places across the country. Um, Washington State will be almost entirely vote by mail. Um, Election Line did a look back at the primaries, and in the states where we could get data, um, one quarter of ballots cast during the primary season this year were cast before Election Day. My colleague, um, Paul Gronke, who's a consultant to the Pew Center on the States and a professor at Reed College, estimates that as many as one in three ballots will be cast before Election Day. I don't know that we'll ever see anybody legislating a statewide vote by mail like Oregon did, um, but I think if you are an election official in the 21st century, you have to at least be aware of early voting. And just to give you a flavor of how far this has gone, especially in this year, I live in the state, the great commonwealth of Virginia, and Virginia has excuse required absentee balloting. You're supposed to provide an excuse in order to get an absentee ballot. Registrars in Virginia are openly admitting that they are going to very liberally interpret what it means to be absent, to the, almost to the extent of I didn't feel like going to the polling place will qualify <laughs> as an absence in the Commonwealth of Virginia. They know, that, back to my 10, 100, 1,000 example with voting machines, they know that anything that gets a qualified, informed voter out of line at the polling place and still gets a ballot in is something they want to do. So whether or not anybody legislates an Oregon-style solution, I think voters eventually are going to expect, at least some voters are going to expect it in the very near future. And can vote by mail work in Texas? Well, I mean, from an administrator point of view, talk about simplicity. It would just eliminate half of the problems with elections, excessive polling places, election workers. But obviously, that's a very much of a policy political decision. And um, in Texas, our greatest source of fraud has always been in the area of vote by mail. So there's a lot of resistance to extending that or making it any looser. 
um, than it is. And interestingly, um, we've experimented a little bit with super precincts in Texas. You know, we're basically you have the early voting concept on election day. And in some communities, especially in the political communities, they really don't like that trend away from the precinct. Since so many political parties have always, it's been a grassroots organization. So there's such a history of that precinct level um, grassroots organization that there's a little bit of a hesitation to that. So, I mean, um, I, I don't think, I, can't, I don't see Texas going that route in the near future. David, does the voting industry fear vote by mail? Um, well, no, I'm actually just going to chime in with my own kind of context. I mean, this goes back to customer expectations and just a word of caution. And uh, often I go and speak to groups and talk about uh, the difference between the perception of risk with electronic voting versus what history has shown us just recently, eight years ago. And it goes back to the social values or norms associated with that community and whether or not they want to potentially run the risk of, again, in a close election, you're going to have to discern potentially voter intent because. Again, there are thresholds built into the machinery, uh, especially when it comes to scanning uh, ballots. If a, if a voter mismarks that ballot, you can end up once again in the situation in which, in a close election, you have teams of observers trying to discern intent. And we have to remember that after the 2000 election, that was what led us to the Help America Vote Act because voter confidence was perceived to have been damaged even in the presence of paper ballots. So it's just one of those trade-offs, not to say one technology is better than the other, Again, the industry provides both. It's just a question of a, really a reflection of the social values. I think we have time for one last question. Yes, sir. What are other countries doing? To what extent can we learn from electronic voting from other countries? I didn't hear the question. Okay. Done. Yeah. Using the international example is, is a little bit tricky because I really I, I hate to be an exceptionalist, but um, the American system is so unique. Um, it's almost the, um, the duck-billed platypus of election systems around the world in that um, since we're not a party-less democracy, you know, where you're from matters incredibly in this country. And so um, if you think the American election, we don't have a national election system like many countries do. We have a stained glass window of thousands and thousands of local jurisdictions and where you're from matters. And so while we can look, um, and actually Professor Wallach and I are going to be going to the Carter Center in Atlanta tomorrow to, to talk to them about um, applying some of their international experience, but the challenge in importing that knowledge to the United States is that, that it's just such a different animal that um, it, it doesn't scan, that if you can, using electronic voting in a partyless democracy is, is as simple as vote for this party. Um, it isn't that simple in the United States. That said, I don't think the American um, the government having worked so hard to export democracy for almost two centuries can afford um, to turn a deaf ear to good ideas from abroad. Now, I'm not recommending um, the kind of um, text voting that like, they're testing in Estonia. I'm not recommending some of the other innovations, but at least to listen to those experiences and find out what worked, what didn't, and maybe there is some sort of applicability to our system um, may be helpful. But in terms of just saying we should we should do it here because it worked in Brazil or it worked in England or it worked in the Netherlands, um, it's it's just not that simple. Dana, did you have something? I, I would like to add just mm -hmm. one thing, and, and that is that many of the internet, I've served as an election consultant, which means I, I wasn't just an observer going in watching things on election day. I was there beforehand helping write the policy manuals and the procedure manuals for the conduct of an election, and I've been in um, South Africa, Bangladesh, Bosnia, and Kosovo. And in all of those places, there are the, the things that struck me most were that our, our citizens demand something a little different than what we see overseas. Um, the, and the number one thing they demand is they will not wait in line at a polling place. They, that, the, the tolerance for that in other places is, is much, much higher than Americans would ever tolerate. So that means we have to do a whole lot more. So we're already being asked to be a step ahead of what the level of services that's being applied in other places. The other thing that I would add is, is that in, in so many of the places around the world where I've, I've watched elections, and it's been more than just where I've worked, um, the, you know, the government or the, or the army, the, the armed services, 
plays a huge role in the conduct of the election. And that, that's neither a good nor a bad thing. But in the United States, it, the conduct of elections is really about a neighborhood polling place, and it's about Aunt Sally and Uncle Bob doing the election on election day. So ironically, we've got very, very high ex expectations for the level of convenience that American voters want on the one hand, and then on the other hand, we've got this very, um, you know, mom and pop store delivery of election services on the ground. So I, I don't think our own expectations exactly meet in the middle, much less trying to compare them with an, an international uh, example as well. Um, the, and the other thing that Americans won't do is they probably won't like inking their fingers either. <laughs> Dana, can you uh, uh, just say, uh, or Ann, uh, voter registration deadline and when does early voting start in Texas? Just give us some some uh, dates here. Okay, October 6th. For those of you that are not registered, October 6th is the deadline. Um, your application either needs to be received by that date or postmarked by that date. Um, early voting begins October 20th, and you can vote, as long as you're registered, you can vote at any early voting location in your county. The last day to vote early is October 31st. If you're away from your county of residence, the last day to submit your application to vote by mail is October 28th. That's a receipt date. The county clerk has to receive your application by that date. And of course, election day is November 4th. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ronnie now, but uh, let me just add my personal thanks once again to this fine panel for a terrific discussion. And my thanks also to the Center for Politics and Governance. Ronnie? I think you can see why race class is so popular and why we are so fortunate to have him uh, associated with the center. And we are, as Ray said, especially grateful to our stellar panelists today for taking time out of their schedule so close to election day to come here and help us uh, deal with these issues. In striving to provide a forum for debate and discussion and hopefully solutions, the center is entirely dependent on the participation of experts in the field, those people who are actively shaping policy on a daily basis. And so please join me in thanking Ray and the panel again for stepping <laughs> Footage from uh, today's discussion will be available on the CPG website, so I urge all of you to check that out. Um, in addition, you can look at our upcoming events. Our next event will be a screening of The Choice, uh, which is the PBS Frontline documentary, which is uh, produced by the Center's own Director of Research Studies, Paul Steckler, and that will be October 14th, so, so please check that out. And again, thank you for coming. We depend on your participation as well. So thank you so much for your participation and support.